Recording is rolling. It is Monday, May 6th. So get pretty close to this final exam. Uh, you guys remember last week I gave you guys one of these study guides. Everybody's got their study guides out right now. Which is a good thing to have because uh, you can use this on the final exam. Also a calculator. You, get, you guys can use uh, any notes you guys write on the study guide is okay too. So if you guys are writing notes on your study guide, they'll be all right. The, the final exam is going to be the same format as the midterm was, if you remember that. Here are going to be 50 conceptual questions. Now, the study guide has 100 conceptual questions, so 50 of those are going to be showing up. Uh, also, there's 10 puzzle questions that are five points apiece. Uh, basically, just can you navigate physics formulas and apply algebra, right? So, right. Oh, okay, right. Okay, so you guys get there? All right, then uh, when are you guys taking this? So seniors are taking this on Thursday the 16th, and then everybody else is taking it the week after that. Okay. Of course, we're on this uh, fun schedule today. Looks about like this. All right. So, okay. So you guys see, uh, you guys started second period today and then so on. And then uh, you're going to start third period tomorrow and be there for about two and a half hours and, and so on. All right. All right. So your lunch is with your uh, fourth period class today is lunch. All right. There you go. All right. Let's check out these multiple choice questions here, these conceptual questions. Okay. So we got a good start on this back last week. Let's see, you guys. Ooh. All right, we're picking up here. Hey, number 30, I think, was the last one we were doing back on Friday, and then the bell was ringing here. Uh, the fact that desert sand had, is very hot in the day and very cold at night. Uh, is that evidence that sand has a low specific heat capacity? Right, that's the last one you guys got back from Friday, right? Right, it's really easy to heat up and cool down sand, right? And so you get these crazy temperature swings out in the desert. Uh, when an iron ring is heated, the hole becomes. Let's look at an iron ring. Okay, so let's see how this iron. Ring, there was a day uh, I played a bunch of Paul Hewitt demos for you guys, where he was doing a bunch of thermodynamics and materials demos, and this was one of them. Remember we had this ring, right? It was heating this up. So the little, little flame right here. Okay, there you go. There, there's like a, a flame heat up. Okay. Okay, now you guys know that most materials, when you heat them up, they'll expand, right? There's a few weird exceptions, but metals are gonna expand, right? So guys, does this does this metal part here, here's the metal part here, right? Here, kind of half side in, right? You guys see this metal part, right? Does the metal itself expand when it's heated with this flame? Yeah, right. But the question is. What about this hole in the middle? Does the hole itself get bigger? Now we're assuming uniform heating. Uh, do, does the hole in the middle get bigger? Yes, it does. The, whole, the entire thing gets larger, right? including the hole. Right? As long as you heat it uniformly, the entire thing expands. Right? Remember, there's a whole explanation. Right? So, right. During a very cold winter, water pipes sometimes burst. The reason for this is, ooh, uh, okay, does, does, does water expand when it freezes? Does water expand when it freezes? Yeah, that's why ice floats, right? Right. Again, like most materials, if they go from liquid to solid, they'll occupy less volume. But, but water is uh, an exception to that, right? Uh, actually, water uh, in, in a solid state uh, uh, usually occupies a crystal type form. That's why snowflakes have six sides, right? This kind of goes hand in hand with that. Right? Freeze water, it'll expand. It'll burst some pipes, possibly. A bimetallic strip will bend when heated because, ooh, let's look at a bimetallic strip. Okay. This was another one of these Paul Hewitt demos. Okay. Uh, so break down the word, bimetallic, bi two, metallic metal, right? so like two metals. What if, what if you put these two different metals together, two different materials, right? and then you heat those here. Let's throw another flame right here. Here's a flame to heat this up. Okay. Uh, do you guys remember thermal, expansion. Right. Now, if, if, if it was like a long rod and I was saying the what's the change in length of the rod is equal to its initial length times the coefficient of thermal expansion times the change in temperature. Right? Hey, we're, we're heating this up. We're changing the temperature. Right? But if these are different metals, maybe the top metal is oh copper and the bottom metal is like aluminum. Or just two different metals. Right? Hey, are these metals going to expand at different rates? Yeah, and that would cause this whole thing to er, bend, right? Uh, now, uh, Paul Hewitt had an addendum on top of that. He said if you turn this into like a loop, like a coil, right, then the whole coil could expand or contract, right? So a little bit, 
uh, and that could uh, you could use that to represent a thermostat. Right? So I'm going to say bimetallic distributable bend when heated because uh, each metal expands at a different rate. Right? Got two different materials going on. Right? They'll expand at a different rates, and then that causes the bimetallic strip to bend. Heat transfer by conduction in metals occurs when. Ooh, I remember there was three main forms of heat transfer. Uh, there was conduction, convection, and radiation. Hey, you guys remember those? Hey, so conduction, that was the one where it was direct contact of surfaces. Let's see if we see something like that. See, atoms give off heat in the form of electromagnetic waves. No, that sounds like radiation. Large numbers of atoms move place to place. Hmm, that sounds a lot like convection, not what we're looking for. Electromagnetic waves, eh, that's radiation. Hey, electrons bump into atoms and other electrons. Hey, right, that sounds like direct contact to surfaces. Right? Why can't I pick up this pin? Oh, because electrons in my hand, electrons in the pin, push against each other. Right? Now here we're talking about heat transfer, but that's what conduction is, right? Direct contact to surfaces. Right? Electrons against other electrons and atoms. Hey, everybody good so far? Right, if you guys got any questions, then stop me, raise your hand, let me know. Heat transfer by convection. Ooh, you guys remember ever say like convection currents, right? Uh, like uh, for, here, for example, if you look at where Europe is on the map, doesn't Europe have pretty much the same latitude as oh Canada and Russia? So wait, why is Canada super cold and Russia super cold, but Europe is temperate? Ah, because isn't there a convection current to so the Gulf Stream travels all the way across the Atlantic and uh, dumps a bunch of uh, thermal energy over there. So see what we're looking for convection. Electromagnetic waves, eh, that's radiation. Atoms give off heat. Oh, electromagnetic waves again. Eh. Electrons bump into other electrons. Okay, that was conduction. So eh. large numbers of atoms move place to place, right? Could be, could be convection current, could be an example of that. Okay. Heat travels from the sun to earth. Now, guys, from the sun to earth, is that crossing the vacuum of space? And there's only one kind of heat transfer that can cross the vacuum of space. Which one is that? Radiation, electromagnetic radiation. There you go. So that's the only one that makes sense there. Okay. Uh, which cools at a faster rate? A pot of boiling water left at room temperature or lukewarm water left at the, the same temperature? Now, the key here is uh, cools at a faster rate, the word rate. Right? So let's, let's do a diagram here. Right, yeah. A graph you gotta do. You guys remember Newton's law of cooling? Suppose, uh, here, what if you have um, like a pot of water, or maybe you have maybe you have two pots of water, right? One with near boiling water and one with lukewarm water, right? You're saying what's the temperature? So I'll throw a little thermometer in here, right? The temperature as a function of time. So we put temperature, say in Kelvin on the vertical axis, time and oh, well, foot seconds, but it could be hours or something on the horizontal. All right. So what does this look like? Right. So Oh, um, maybe there maybe there's a room temperature. I'll put temperature E and V for environment, like the environmental temperature of the room temperature down here. Right. Uh, I bet whatever temperature this water is is going to asymptotically approach that value after time. Right. I'll put some initial temperature here. Call this T naught. Right. So, all right. You you leave your uh, pot of hot water there at you know super hot temperature. Right. You come back a few hours later and oh. Uh, now it's, uh, it's it's about room temperature a few hours later, pretty close to, right? right. Now we're comparing uh, two different points here. So like uh, if it was really hot, maybe it could be like right about here, right? Versus lukewarm. Lukewarm could be like maybe like right about here, right? Uh, let's look at, um, you know, the, again, the, the key for it here, let me point this out. Um, cools at a faster rate, at a faster rate. Now guys, on a temperature versus time, graph. We're talking about the rate change of something. Guys, the rate change. Isn't that like an instantaneous slope? Right? Like if I hold my ruler flush to the curve and say, oh, I hear when it was really hot, uh, that's a pretty steep curve. You guys see the rise over run of that slope? Right? Versus here's the lukewarm, which eventually become you know, after just enough time. If I hold my ruler flush to that and make a tangent line and say, what's the slope of that line? Ah, do you guys see that initially it was really steep and now it's a lot shallower, right? And then more time you wait, it's just gonna get shallower and shallower, right? Until it reaches room temperature and, there, and there's, and, and the rate of heat exchange when it reaches room temperature would just be zero, 
right? Zero temperature for time. So uh, I think the one that's going to cool at a faster rate would would be the boiling water. Would that be the case? Right, you guys see it? Okay. Uh, this, this is one of the things I want you guys to get out of this class is think about the difference between an absolute value of something versus the rate change of something, right? Kind of like uh, when we did position velocity and acceleration, right? That was also that same uh, dynamic, right? Which at the the, the math for that, by the way, is, is calculus, right? If you've been in calculus, you're like, oh yeah, we, we do this instantaneous rate change with slopes all the time, right? You guys see that slope of a tangent line? Uh, planet Earth loses heat primarily by, oh, okay. well, if, if we're importing heat from the sun through the vacuum of space, and that was radiation, how are we getting rid of the heat? You think it also radiates away, right? Right, makes sense, right? right. Uh, now, to add a little bit onto this, uh, this, this is a balance, right? So we get some energy from the sun, solar energy from radiation. We're releasing it by radiation. And hopefully, uh, ideally, it's, it's pretty stable, right? Uh, now, Earth also gets heat from geothermal, right? So there's heat from the center of the Earth that radiates out. Uh, so that's part of the equation. Um, and then uh, uh, humans burning fossil fuels all over the place. I also, uh, that, that's, that's another source of, uh, of energy too, right? throw things a little bit out of balance there. All right, number 39, at high altitudes, the boiling point of water. Hmm, what, what did happen to the boiling point of water at different altitudes? All right, so boiling point of water uh, at high altitude. All right, well, let's uh, compare different locations. So guys, down at sea level, we're pretty much at sea level. What's the boiling point of water down at sea level? 100 degrees Celsius? Right. Or you could have said 212 Fahrenheit, that's okay too, but you know, with 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, ooh, guys, what if you take water at room temperature and put it in a vacuum chamber? Does the water boil at room temperature in a vacuum chamber? Yeah, you guys remember low pressure boiling, reduced pressure boiling? Right. Now, Denver, Colorado, which is a high altitude, is somewhere between those two. Right. It's not sea level, it's not, it's not a vacuum either. Right. Uh, right. So uh, water would boil at 95 degrees Celsius up in the mountains. Up, up in Denver, specifically a mile high. So I'm going to say the boiling point of water is uh, is lower at high altitudes, right? right? 100 degrees Celsius at sea level, 95 degrees in Denver, and then the higher you go, paper's off. In space, water will just boil at room temperature. When snow forms, the air becomes warmer because of the surrounding air, right? Ooh, but when, when snow's forming, hey, is that like little droplets of water, maybe water vapor turning into a solid form, right? Okay, now to, get, to go from, a, say, like a gas or a liquid to a solid, aren't you giving away energy, right? But first law of thermo, you can't destroy that energy. It has to go somewhere. Ah, so it's going to go to surrounding air, hence it become warm, warmer. Let's see if there's an answer choice that says that. Let's see, option A, changing from a vapor to a solid is a process that gives off energy. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I just said, right? We're going from... Yeah, vapor to a solid, right? gives off energy, boom. Right? Snow is a solid form of water, right? So that is a crystal pattern, six sides. The first law of thermodynamics is a restatement of, so there, there were these laws of thermodynamics. There was a zeroth law, the first, the second, and the third law. We mostly just focused on the first and second law, right? And the first law, that was conservation of energy, right? You can't create energy, you can't destroy energy. You can do energy accounting. You can transfer different forms. Right? Uh, one of the many problems I gave you guys was if there's a waterfall, right? And if you know the height of the waterfall, in fact, it's made out of water, you can calculate what's the temperature rise at the bottom. Might have been about a degree Celsius, right? A little bit. It's going to go up a little, right? Uh, 42. The greater the difference in temperature between input reservoir and output reservoir for a heat engine. What does that do to the efficiency? Ah, I can't give you guys a formula for this. Formula, right. uh, oh, oh, here, I got, a, I got a heat engine right here within reaching distance. Because remember I played you guys a Bill Nye video on this one. He had the Sterling engine, ah, that's what it's called, right? He actually did two versions of this. He took the Sterling engine, he put it on a, uh, a glass of really hot water and it started spinning, right? Then, because there was a temperature differential between that hot water and the room temperature, which was relatively cool. Right? Then he took this and put it back over on a vat of ice water. Right? 
and in reverse direction, it's, it's, it's spinning the other way, right? Again, there was a temperature differential, but now the room temperature was relatively warmer and the ice water was cooler, right? Okay. But right now, as you guys are looking at it, uh, you're actually seeing the answer to this question because right now the temperature differential between the bottom and the top is zero because it's the same temperature, right? Whatever this is minus that, right? There, there's no difference. So it doesn't move at all. That's like 0% efficient in that case. And uh, more generally, it goes like this. So this is Greek letter eta, which in physics is usually used for efficiency. So I'll label that efficiency. Say for a heat engine, is this is one formula. One minus the temperature of the cold sink over the temperature of the hot sink. Right? Uh, so let's run this a little bit, because I think it's going to show up a little bit here. Right? So the coldest cold sink you could ever theoretically have might be zero Kelvin. Oh, wait, notice I'm saying Kelvin, because you have to use absolute temperature scale for, for these odds, right? And let's say your hot sink is like a thousand Kelvin, just right. Zero versus a thousand. Guys, what's zero over a thousand? It'd be zero. Yeah, one minus zero is one. And you can interpret that as 100%, right? Now, realistically, you'll never get down to zero Kelvin, which means you'll never quite reach 100% efficiency, right? Um, okay, but this question saying, what, what, what if you vary the temperature, the cold sink versus the hot sink, right? Okay, so see, I know if they're really far apart, like zero versus 1,000 Kelvin, you could go up to 100% efficiency, right? What if it's the same temperature? What if I got 300 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin? Guys, what's 300 over 300? One, one minus one is zero, right? That's not moving at all, right? Ah, I think if I want my machine to have better efficiency, I want to increase the difference between those two seats, right? The, those temperature differences, right? Especially make the cold really cold if I can. Right? So is there one that says that the greater the difference in temperature between input and output reservoir, the greater the efficiency. That's what we're looking for. Okay, everybody good so far, good so far, all right. Okay, two identical blocks of iron. Why well, I like this question. One is at 10 degrees Celsius, one's at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so identical means maybe they're the same mass and they're also the same material, right? So uh, it's over, over iron in this case, right? So 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius. I'll pause right there. Guys, if this was a pretty well insulated system, it's called a closed system, right? And you walked away for like four hours and came back, would you expect those two blocks to kind of meet in the middle, like 15 degrees Celsius, 15 degrees Celsius, right? That's what you would expect, right? right. Okay, all right, okay. So you would expect it. Let's see. Now back to this question. They're put into contact. Suppose the cooler block cools even more down to five degrees Celsius and the warm one warms up even more to five degrees Celsius, so, uh, by, 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 to 25. So one lost five degrees, the other picked up five degrees, right? Now, you guys just told me that it's not something you would ever expect to happen because that would be a violation specifically of which law? The first or the second? Let me say the, the second law, second law, right? Yeah, second law, there you go, right? Good, because the, the first law is actually okay. The first law just says you can't create or destroy energy. And if there's same mass, same material, one drops by five, the other picks up by five, that one's actually safe, right? But the second law, this is the one that has a time order to it. Right, so you put something hot next to something cold, you expect it to reach an equilibrium in the middle, right? but not the other way around. Right? Uh, this is the one that says that as time moves forward, entropy in the universe always goes up. Right? Entropy was what's the heat exchange divided by the temperature it's happening at. Right? And if you take these numbers at face value and check the entropy, the entropy would actually be decreasing, which is statistically never going to happen for large blocks of iron. Okay. Right, so you guys get with the violation of the second law of thermo? One says entropy in the universe should increase with time. There's a time order of processes. Ooh, here's, here's another question I like a lot. Running a refrigerator with, with its door open in a hot room makes the room what, cooler or warmer, right? Let's just narrow it down to one of those two. It's either cool or warm, right? So right, walk you guys through this again. Because uh, not too long ago, we were looking at, you guys remember Maxwell's demon? Is, it's kind of related to this idea, right? Uh, if you start with um, a hot sink next to a cold sink, yeah, you'll expect to reach equilibrium lukewarm. Right? But what if you just start with a bunch of lukewarm air? It's never going to spontaneously split hot and cold. Right? Now, you could force that to happen. That's what refrigeration is. That's what air conditioning is. We just start with a bunch of just room temperature air, and somehow we got to get something cold. But don't forget the other part of this equation, which is something else gets super hot, and we got to dump that somewhere else. Right? Now, the case of a refrigerator, uh, guys, try this when you go home tonight. 
uh, reach back behind the refrigerator or underneath the refrigerator. I bet it's gonna be what, because behind it, warm, warm, hot. Yeah, it's gonna be hot, right? Right. Okay, so now, and then the cold is being dumped into the fridge. But what if you do this? What if you open the fridge in the morning and you just leave it running all day? So you got cold air dumping out the front all day and you close the doors in your house and you come back later, right? Okay, what's the answer to this question? It's make the room what? Warmer, warmer, yes. Now, on face value, you might say, well, isn't the cold out the front and the warm out the back canceling each other out, right? Which is a good starting place, except that, remember, this is an energy intensive process. It's not spontaneous. You have to have that fridge plugged into the wall. You're taking energy off the grid. You're adding energy to the system. Overall, it's going to heat up your house. Yeah, warmer. All right. The ideal efficiency for a heat engine between 2050 Kelvin and 310 Kelvin. Hey, that's what this is for. Uh, you got, uh, I said you could take notes on your study guide, right? Notes on your study guide. All right, you guys write this one down. Efficiency is this right here. So that when you guys get this question, which I guess 50-50 um, shot, right? Uh, so let's plug in the numbers here. Uh, I mean, you, you might have different temperature sinks. Right? Let's say the cold sink is 310 Kelvin, eh, which is kind of a cold room temperature. Right? Maybe wear a jacket. And 2050 Kelvin. Okay, now that is pretty hot. Boom, boom. All right, let's see, what is the ideal efficiency? I would say maximum efficiency, ideal efficiency. I'm gonna use that over that. Say I have a Sterling engine here, all right? So 0 0.8498 at rounds two. Hey, can I interpret that as about 85% thereabouts? I guess that 85%, right? Uh, but you guys can navigate that formula, right? That's, um, and you guys see why that formula can make sense. We, we walked through that a few minutes ago. And so do I see 85%? Yep, there's 85%. Yeah. All right, so you guys good with ideal efficiency? Heat engine. Uh, standing wave. Oh, we're moving on to waves. Wave time. Standing waves can be set up, say, blowing across the top of a soda bottle. Hey, if you blow across the top of, let's say, a glass bottle, so it resonates like a single tone. I, I bet that's a standing wave. It's a longitudinal sound wave, but that could be a standing wave. Strings of musical instruments, pluck a guitar string. Bow, wow, wow, wow. It goes into this type of vibration, which is transverse. Uh, maybe it's half a wavelength, you could call it. But that could also be a standing wave, right? Different kind of wave that's here. Hey, organ pipes. Ooh, I bet that's uh, really similar to blowing across the top of a bottle. I think all of those could be standing waves. Uh, again, we're looking at a mix of different type of waves. There's some transverse here. There's some longitudinal here. Uh, that's okay. They could be standing waves. Right. Uh, suppose a bug is jiggling up and down and swimming towards you at the same time. Compared to the frequency that the bug is emitting waves, the frequency that the waves is reaching you. Check this out. Right. Let's put a bug in the water. Right. And what if he's just jiggling up and down uh, and, and also not moving? Right. And also the water's not flowing. Right. Is he sending out if you were to watch the crests of the waves, you think the crests of the waves could follow these concentric circles. And then if you look down at the side, it'd be like, bloop, bloop, bloop. Right, you guys remember this? Right, and then back behind him, say, bloop, bloop, bloop. Right? Right. Now let's give this bug some motion. Let's say he's swimming right at you. While he's doing his bug jiggle. Right? Uh, do you guys think, think he's catching up with the very waves that he's sending out? Right? Now, once those waves have been released out into the environment, do they just travel at whatever speed they go through that particular medium? In this case, maybe water, right? Yeah, the, the speed of these waves is just whatever it is, right? But he's, but he's catching up with the wave fronts he said now. So the wave crest reaching you, say like if you're on the side, it's like bleep, bleep, bleep. And then if he's swimming away from you, it'd be like bloop, 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 right? Oh, notice we got different concepts here. We got, got speed versus frequency, right? Guys, See if you guys are following what I just said. Does the speed of those wave ripples change? No, 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 no. Right. But what about frequency? Because if he's swimming towards you, are those wave crests reaching you more frequently? Ah, that they are. More frequently they're reaching you. So I'm gonna say a higher frequency. If it, as long as he's swimming towards you. Is that called the Doppler effect? Is that what that is? Okay. Um, okay. As the, so, ooh. Are we at the in the class? I think yeah, yeah. I think it's a uh, time to pack up right here. I'm gonna put period three right here. All right. Well, 
pick up there tomorrow.